Pictures of AT&T's Bell Labs from the 1960s always seem to show a model, button-down corporate laboratory. But within Incredible Machine is footage of a radical experiment, an informal art and science collaboration that would transform both worlds. The collaboration stemmed from a chance meeting between a Bell Labs engineer named Billy Kluver and an artist named Jean Tangli, who ultimately worked together on a sculpture machine that destroyed itself in the courtyard of the Museum of Modern Art. When word of this event reached John Pierce, the head of Bell Labs communication research at the time, he was inspired to create more opportunities for artists and scientists to work together informally. The collaborations would even go so far as to include such luminaries as Andy Warhol, Robert Rauschenberg, and John Cage. One of these collaborations appears halfway through the film. The scientist Ken Knowlton working with artist Stan Vanderbeek on an experimental film using early computer graphics invented at Bell Labs. Incredible Machine itself is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art today, an early example of cross-pollination between inventors and artists whose methods are not that far apart. Enjoy the film. We're at the beginning of a new wave of research. Our creative powers are being stretched. We're learning surprising things about how we sense the world around us. Exploring the mysteries of the spoken word. Nice. Nice. It appears to us that the resistors should track very well with one another. So I think in the first go around here, we should well, make all the resistors variable. This on and, uh, see how These men are design engineers at Bell Telephone Laboratories, the research and development part of the Bell system. They're about to engage a new breed of computer called Graphic One in a dialogue that will test the ingenuity of both men and machine. It's a new way of working out abstract problems in the age-old medium of drawings and designs, which explains why the technique is called computer graphics. Our researchers have an idea for a telephone filter circuit they want to try out, but they need a ready answer for the problem. If they do this, what will happen? They could spend many hours in the workshop building and testing the real thing. Instead, they'll draw their circuit directly on Graphic One's cathode ray tube. The operator talks to the computer with an electronic light pen, which does a precise and easy job of assembling the symbolic parts of the design. Diodes, resistors, transformers, and all are automatically positioned by the pen, connecting them as it goes along. I think the drawing will be much more readable if we place a three-terminal device down the lower right-hand corner. You want to move this down yes. over here? Yes, if they far. change their plan, that's no problem either. There's no need to memorize complex rules, for the computer signals the action when it's ready. If the researchers have done a good job of programming what they want the design to do, the computer is quick to point out any breakdown in their logic. Hold on, Tim. I think so. No, you... You left out the uh, one uh, number in this specification of the two board. We left out the input of peaks. Right. Let's make that one meg ohm. Uh, oh, okay, let's try again. The design is complete. But will it work? At this stage, a remotely located master computer takes over the job of calculating okay. the performance curves of the circuit. Okay, let's go. Right. Uh, 
I think it looks good. We certainly don't have to worry about the Amplify we're using based on this. On some of these letter things here, we're not doing it right. It's too gray. How much trouble is it to get that change to some other color? Just find the right place in the program, make the appropriate change, and we'll run the whole thing again. Let's make uh, bug A go, uh, what would you say, down one square and right one square. So you see what we'll get is, is the program going through these lines. A consulting graphic artist and a Bell Laboratory scientist are collaborating on an idea for an experimental computer-made movie. That come out of it, you okay. know, and, and right. yes, this idea yes. of you being yes. able to, to program something so we know what it's supposed to do, and what I get a great deal of response out of is you don't know what it's exactly going to do in terms of images. In it's direction. interesting to me that, that you say the unexpected things that happen. Yeah. Because in, in a sense, the computer has done exactly what you told it to do, right? Their shooting script is an intricate set of instructions written in one of several programming languages available. This one is B-Flix, short for Bell Labs Flix. This is an excerpt from a B-Flix computer movie showing how the script, now a deck of punch cards with all the cues typed in, is fed into the computer, winding up as a reel of recorded tape. Hey, Bernie? Yes, sir. I've got another Beatflix movie here on two reels. Can you possibly do it now? Sure can. Great. No that's, that's the second half. All right. And uh, this is the first one. All right. Fine. We'll run it right now. How do you want these run, Jen? Uh, please run it just halfway between F5.6 and F8. Leave it perfectly in focus. Under computer control now, the taped information is converted into rapidly moving pictures made up of a fine mosaic of points of varying light intensity. A synchronized movie camera automatically photographs the fast moving images as they are plotted and drawn on the face of a cathode ray tube. out to this technology. I want to incorporate this technology into, into my art and, and have the two mixed together. And for instance, what spellbinds me as an idea is that I'll be able to sit someplace in a railroad station and uh, write a movie, or maybe even pick up a telephone eventually and write a movie. Besides creating unique visual effects, computer movies can be used to show phenomena we can't directly see. This film describes the motion of a communication satellite. By studying it, scientists can obtain new insight into the satellite's stabilizing system. Only a man orbiting alongside could observe it the same way. Experimenters in visual perception are using computers to create weird, random patterns that never occur in real life, to find out what and how people see when these patterns are shown to them. These patterns are curiously reminiscent of the pointillism of the 19th century artist Sura, whose beautifully integrated paintings are formed by countless computer-like dots and dashes. The art of Sura is an incredibly methodical technique that produced only a dozen or so paintings in his lifetime. Today, researchers are generating that many in a single day. The shape and texture of perceived objects are studies that look deep into the future of communications. When we learn to separate the relevant from irrelevant in visual information, we'll be on the way to sending three-dimensional color picture messages over ordinary telephone lines.
And then we found that when you get back far enough, not only do the small pictures disappear because you're not close enough to see them individually, and the big picture comes across, but if you get even further back, then the uh, picture takes on a continuous tone quality, as though it were a photograph, rather than being a very crude, computer-generated, spatially quantized thing. One of the interesting things to me was that you can draw quite a distinguishable picture on just an 11 by 11 array of black spots and white spots. The entire musical score accompanying this film was composed on a computer that can produce nearly endless variations of sounds. We're interested in finding better ways of describing complicated sounds like speech. However, speech is still very complicated. Music is simpler, and some of the methods which we are using here to describe music in terms of a graphical function can also be used for speech, and we can find out a great deal by studying these simpler sounds. Programming the score is like composing for conventional musical instruments, except that notes are replaced by numbers. The computer converts these numbers into impulses that cause sound waves to come directly from a loudspeaker. What actually happens when we hear sounds? We know that the membrane of the inner ear changes sound waves into audible sensations. But until recently, no one had seen the whole inner ear in action. When sound waves strike the membrane, it makes thousands of microscopic movements per second. Only by computer could they be calculated and for the first time pictorially described. It takes several minutes of this motion to draw the simple sound of yes. Since the model of the inner ear is being expressed mathematically, it can be pictured in different ways. In this 3D version, the membrane is given a spiral shape, recoiling as it receives shocks from simulated sound waves. Now, aside from some of the standard problems of showing three-dimensional movies, when we showed these movies up in Boston, I think the, uh, some of the people up there were quite interested and excited in what they saw. Yes, I suppose that as an educational tool, it's very good. It allows people to see things which only mathematicians could see before. And people who seemed most interested were the medical doctors and uh, people like audiologists. Human speech, seemingly so simple, is a very complicated process no one fully understands. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep. Those words were spoken by a digital computer programmed to simulate a speaking machine. Much of what we know about voice and speech is stored in the computer's memory. From there, we can experiment with more advanced ideas in areas that are still unknown. Take stress. How do we always seem to know just which parts of spoken words to emphasize? Ruth, let's try to synthesize that sentence. Okay, do you want monotone pitch? Let's hear it on monotone first. Okay. Scientists can only begin to explain how we speak. We stress words without thinking, giving them fine shadings of pitch and intensity. I like my glossy black. Let's see if we can change that stress on my. How about on my and black? Would that be all right? Fine, let's try it. When phonetic symbols are fed to the synthesizer, it combines them into intelligible speech. I like my glossy black. I like my glossy black. Well, there's more inflection on it, but let's see if we can uh, improve this. Why don't we look at the pitch curve now? 
I think I'll try to make the uh, inflection on black a little bit stronger. I like light on the black. Let's see if I can improve that. I like light on the black. The art of computer graphics is only in its infancy. Yet it is already stimulating creative thought in far out areas where research is likely to get complex and unwieldy. It offers not only the means to quicken the pace of discovery, but an ideal way of communicating what we may discover.